Now, when I first started fleshing out the year of the aircraft carrier, when I st first started working on it, I had this idea of, so you want to build an aircraft carrier, and I thought, well, can I make it into an 11-part series? If I can't make it into an 11-part series, can I make it into a 5- or 6-part series? So, as you know, I do different parts of each series a month. Didn't work out. It's a free parter At which point I was thinking, well, do I have a four-parter and another couple of three-parters, or a, you know, a five-parter, a four-parter, and a three-parter, or, or, so, or something? Do I have something that I can sort of work this out from? And it didn't work out. So I'm not sure when you're going to see the other two parts of these this series this year, but this is going to start off with design. Now, you're probably thinking, hang on Alex, what are the other three parts? If you're starting off with design, what are the other three parts? Well, infrastructure and industry, what you need to be able to build an aircraft carrier, what you need to have in place, and how it's going to affect things. And it is an exact part of design, but it's also separate from design, because in a perfect world... The design requirements, and I'll explain why, should overrule everything else, and everything else should be made to adjust to the design requirements. But reality is often different. Reality is often different, sadly enough. But saying that, and I do mean saying that, things can still work out pretty darn well if you're prepared to make sure they do. And the third part... So you want to build an aircraft carrier operation and learning from experience. So, part one, design. Part two, the realities of construction. And part three, operation and learning from experience. Roughly the three parts. So it's, it's hopefully going to be a fun little extra bonus series that's going to be happening this year. And I hope you will enjoy it. But yes, so you want to build an aircraft carrier. Really? You want to? That is really what you want to do. Are you sure? Are you really sure you want to build an aircraft carrier? Because it's not for everyone. Not everyone needs one. And that's what part of this whole video is going to be about. Explaining when a carrier is needed, when a carrier isn't needed, and what sort of questions you have to ask yourself about what sort of carrier you need and you want. Now, shameless book plug, this always comes up here, there is a reason for it. I'm an academic, and as much as, frankly, people supporting this channel means a lot to me, and it's so useful to me, and it matters because it allows me to support this channel and grow this channel, so people subscribing, people liking this channel, people supporting this channel really, really helps. As an academic, when I'm going for job promotions, when I'm trying to get a permanent post, because I'm currently a contract lecturer, I need book sales, because... For some reason, universities still haven't emerged, uh, 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 got to the point where they actually do look at your YouTube videos and go, Wow, they do quite well. Oh, you talk to quite a lot of people. Oh, you're, you're quite good at communicating in that way. Oh, that, that's useful. No, they don't do that. So, I'm sorry. As much as all your support means to me, as much as all your help to the channel is really great and something that I really do thank you for, I also have to ask for this as well. If you're interested and you like naval history, I reckon this book's excellent. I'm going to have some more books coming out later this year. On it, they're going to be ebooks. This is available in ebook form, in hardback form, in paperback form, and it's really, really cool. It's from my own PhD thesis, which was on the development of aircraft carriers. Believe it or not, when I was doing that, I found this whole subspecies of destroyers, which tended to do a lot of stuff with the aircraft carriers, and they got ignored, and there hadn't been a book published about them since 1957, and I went, I'm going to have to fix that. And it turns out that this, that little paper turned into a book long before my PhD thesis actually has turned into a book. That The PhD thesis has still not been turned into a book. There's they people uh, I get told there's too many air, naval aviation books, too many aircraft carry books out there, so the market's full. Sadly enough, probably is. Um, but the little destroyers, which were tacked on and were my own personal passion project, sanity project, while I was doing, while I was coming to the end of the PhD and doing all the editing and getting it all ready for its, for my 
full viva and all my examination, that turned into the book. That's a cool book. So, why? Why do you want an aircraft carrier? What would possibly possess you to think you need an aircraft carrier? Well, the answer is, what do you need an aircraft carrier for? And I haven't listed in here ego. There are some countries, who I swear have literally invested in aircraft carriers, for ego. That is entirely their reason for them. And, well... If you're prepared to pay the bill, or rather your taxpayers are prepared to give the government, whatever form of government that is, the money, under that circumstance to pay for an aircraft carrier, then you have an aircraft carrier. But how can a country, how can you as a national leader work out whether you really need to spend that money on an aircraft carrier, or you can spend that money on, I don't know, schools and hospitals and police and the other things and infrastructure like roads and ports and railways that governments do have to spend money on as well and should spend money on well do you need an out of area expeditionary capability no no that's serious do you need an out of area expeditionary capability do you need an area of cap expeditionary capability the ability to project forces beyond that area at which you naturally sit so if you think of britain it has aircraft carriers. Why? Well, Britain is this quite large, actually. I know people like to go, it's this little island off the coast, off the northern coast of Europe. It's actually not that small an island. It's quite a large island, really. If you look around the world, there are islands which are bigger, but it's quite a big one. It, just because it's not the biggest doesn't mean it's, it's small. Um, but it has lots of connections going on around the world, lots of interests. Why? Because are you a fundamentally maritime economy which depends upon freedom of movement through critical choke points? In the case of Britain, yes. Trade going all around the world. Not just physical trade, but electronic trade on networks of undersea cables, etc. Moving all around the world. And those undersea cables come with their own choke points, by the way. It's brilliant. People always think choke points just are sort of the positions where you've got ships being able to get through narrow spaces like the Suez Canal or Panama Canal or Straits of Gibraltar or the English Channel or, or there are whole loads of ones around there. Malacca Straits, the Straits of Hormuz, all these things. They think of those. There are also maritime choke points which are less discuss uh, discussed, they are less often discussed, but they are data choke points. They are where a lot of cables come together and governments try to be very, very quiet about where they are, but Honestly, you can work out where they are, and there are maps out there, but I'm not putting a map up here of where they are. If you want a really good discussion on those things, ask Sal Merkelagos, okay? The What is Going On in Shipping uh, channel. Sal is brilliant. Ask him about the, data, the global data choke points of the undersea cables, and watch his face break. So... Do you have a dependence upon maritime energy imports? Well, do you? Do you? If you do, if your economy is entirely independent upon importing energy, then you are in trouble if you don't have the ability to protect those routes because those routes are going to be someone's target. They just are. They're always someone's target. In any kind of war, or if it's even not a war, if it's just a grey war scenario where they're trying to choke you before you even get the chance, they'll go for them. It's basically rule 101 of how to win a war without having to fight a war. Starve your opponent of energy or food. Doesn't even have to be that much, just has to be enough They're not that's not getting through to destabilise the economy a bit and stop them being able to conduct operations. It's cynical, but it's effective. Brutally so. Do you have vibrant cult global cultural, social, and political connections which could evolve into military commitments? Again, this is the trouble for Britain, is it hits all three of these. Because of the Commonwealth, and because of the Five Power Lines, because of... NATO, because of AUKUS, because of Five Eyes. There are so many commitments going on there that Britain... The answer to that is, Britain does, yes, have these commitments. And 
the trouble is, you only get out of alliances what you put in on them. So if you believe in a peaceful world where there's not going to be any conflict, you can sign up to alliances and never worry about it because you're never going to need to put anything into them. Because you're never going to need any, to put, get anything out of them. But the moment you're in a world where there is security stresses, where there are risks, where there are conflicts you might have to manage or deter, suddenly those alliances become very important, especially if you don't want to have to do the whole fighting solo, if you don't want to end up finding yourself alone with no one to speak up for you when the hordes are at the door. In which case, that's when you have to make a decision. Because alliances aren't only as strong as their weakest member. That is a very, very poorly phrased saying. It's usually thrown about by people who want to make it stuff. You need to put more money in. You need to put more money in. Yeah, you, alliances are only strong as, as strong as the weakest member. No. Alliances are only as strong as the least willing to commit member. So, if you're willing to commit your forces, and you are spending to the ability of your, uh, you are able to do so, you are a strong member of an alliance. If someone else is spending more money than you, but they aren't prepared to commit their forces, they are not a strong member of the alliance. One of those undermines the alliance, one of those doesn't. So, what's really interesting is when that phrase was originally, originally coined, an alliance is only strong as the weakest member, they meant will to fight. They didn't mean amount of money spent on defense. It tells you something about the modern world that that's how that phraseology has been changed. that people are now more worried and more focused about the image of numbers on a balance sheet than they are of the actual willingness of those people to actually really fight. It's a tough one. Then, separate to the expeditionary capability, let's look at your own domestic capabilities, because these can also require you to have an, uh, have an aircraft carrier. Do you have a large maritime border wherein the sea provides your conflict security for its strategic depth? Frigate, that skewed Britain again. <clears throat> it also skewers America and a few other nations, if you think about it. Do you have a large exclusive economic zone which will require appropriate levels of security? This, if you are a British politician who happens to have been sent this video to watch and you're feeling skewered by all of this, don't worry. There is a reason we have aircraft carriers. We don't have enough of them, but there is a reason. If you are, I don't know, certain other countries around the world who should possibly be considering having aircraft carriers, but don't currently, and you are the politician of that country and watching this video, and you're also feeling skewered, then I'm doing my job. This is what academics are for. Saying the things that politicians don't like to hear. That's what we have been, that's the whole reason behind giving in giving academics academic tenure. Something I don't have. I'm just an independent academic, supported thankfully through everyone being so kind of YouTube and Patreon. So basically, um Oh, it's so tempting to describe myself, uh, describe, to pick any of the famous academics and go, I'm them of naval history. But let's be honest, I haven't got enough subscribers to be that yet. But we can always hope. Maybe I'll get some sensible defense spending and some actual sensible, uh, sensible government oversight of defense spending so it's spent correctly. Do you, finally, are you in a security environment whereby the strategic mobility of an aircraft carrier is desirable? Now, what does that mean? And that means, are you in a scenario where your air bases are likely to be damaged or degraded quickly? Because whilst aircraft carriers on their own, 
please note I'll be getting into the full discussion of aircraft carriers, on their own are not invincible, invincible, invulnerable assets. They do have one major advantage over an airbase. They're not able to usually be able to find their location via Google. That does not mean they're not always able to find their location via Google, because if anyone hasn't ever noticed, I do enjoy on Twitter, or X now called, um, taking full advantage of the fact that operational security around the world is regularly, regularly crushed by people with phones taking pictures of ships as they pass by certain areas of the world. Those lovely choke points. And it's great fun. You can see which ships are transiting where, what they're doing. It's cool. It's lovely. From a security perspective, it does make them to an extent Googleable because you can tra you can spot uh, their route. And there's also AIS, but warships can are usually fairly happy with turning it off and playing all sorts of fun games with that and spoofing it in all sorts of ways. So. Here is where the interesting question comes in. How many of the, do, does any of these criteria meet you? If they don't, then you don't need an aircraft carrier. You can now watch the rest of the video as an enjoyable exercise in a thought experiment. If any of these criteria describe you, you might need an aircraft carrier. And depending on what combination of criteria describe you, that's going to affect likely what type of carrier you need which of course is the next question alrighty then so what are the types of carrier well in the modern world we have broadly speaking five we can go with okay five and I know the bond two are going to be contentious but please let me explain them super carriers what these two lovely beasts are they're American, they're nuclear-powered, they carry air groups which are bigger than some worlds, uh, total air forces. They are the ultimate expressions of the aircraft carrier in our world at this time. They are basically America showing, being able to show up around the world and go... So, do you want to continue playing this game, or do you want to find out what the game gets like when we change the rules? They're also hugely expensive to build, they take time to build, and they are major assets and as such become a major thing about deploying them in this as well. So, there's complications with them. And then you go down the list. In, in this picture, you have got a fleet carrier, a modern fleet carrier. That's HMS Queen Elizabeth. Yes, she's a fleet carrier. Her size... Her capabilities in terms of air group, that puts her in the fleet carrier. She's a fleet carrier role vessel. And then we've got two of the Japanese. Um, they were technically um, helicopter carrying destroyers, or helicopter destroyers, but I think, I think we can now admit that they are light fleet carriers, especially now that the bigger ones can carry F-35Bs. Uh, the smaller one is still theoretically a landing platform helicopter, but who knows, it might get a modification as well. And then we have landing platform helicopter docks, things like the USS America class. Now, with each of these, what's the difference? Well, these are difference of strike and combat, uh, are able to do combat air patrol, strike and airborne early warning and any submarine warfare operations simultaneously. Once you're in a fleet carrier, you're in a level of, you can be doing these missions pretty much simultaneously. You have the air group capacity to carry out these missions simultaneously. To an extent, with a fleet carrier, you're not going to necessarily be able to mount to the same level as a supercarrier. A supercarrier can be carrying out multiple strike missions while maintaining a cap, and multiple... Uh, supporting multiple anti-submarine warfare operations, etc., while uh, in terms of helicopter movements, while carrying out a cap and search and rescue, a fleet carrier is going to be a more limited experience. It's got the full suite of capabilities, but it's more limited in its evolution of a, uh, compared to a super carrier. A light fleet carrier tends to be a far more focused asset. 
it'll tend to be focused on one part of the naval aviation sphere. A landing platform helicopter is an assault asset, but the helicopters it can carry can be used for a range of operations, anti-submarine warfare, they could even mean airborne early warning, although not having fighters and having airborne early warning seems a bit strange, but that might be the way you float, that might be the way you float. Um, and attack gunships, you can have a range of assets. Landing platform helicopter dock, again, usually the same, they can have a range of assets. Also, some of those vessels will be fitted with a ski ramp, in which case they can also fulfill, to extent, the role of a light fleet carrier to an extent. It's going to be a mixed air group. So they're going to be basically be able to do a handful of everything. So if you've got eight fighters, if you consider for a cat to be maintained, a proper cat to be maintained, you're usually looking at 18. That's four in the air, four in alert, the other 10 down in deck somewhere. If the four in the cap get sent to engage a target, the four alert ones will get launched. Four more go up to deck. And if the next uh, cap two has to go and deal with someone, cap three is being brought up, uh, cap three is launched, and then cap four is up on deck while cap one is coming back. And if there's any damaged aircraft, they might be brought up to replace the aircraft in cap one, which has to be taken down to be paired, and etc. cycle through. The minimum you can do this with is 18 aircraft. It has been found to be so since a... Honestly, the early, uh, the late 1920s, they were already experimenting with it. The early 1930s, they're pretty darn sure of it. Both America, Britain get there fairly much, uh, fairly close to each other. Japan, not that much later. It's literally because of how long, it, depending on when you get your carriers into service and you actually start testing it out. Once you have enough carriers in service, you start testing out and going, hang on. If we need to maintain airborne fighters, and if you're wondering how they did it before they had radar, well, in both the US and the UK case, and to extent the Japanese case, they all end up going with the idea of someone being airborne with binoculars and the fighters themselves looking up. So you might have anti-submarine aircraft out on patrol, out of the scout aircraft out on patrol, and if they spot a strike coming in, or a ship spots a strike coming in, the cap I diverted in that direction. But that was covered in a whole other video on this channel, and so please, go through the year of the aircraft carrier, you'll find it, it's a, it's a fun video. So all these represent different options, and again, if you're a minor nation looking for a minor expeditionary capability, then an LHD might well be your choice because it's a one-shop shop. It will literally send take troops, armored vehicles, able to be landed with their heavy with their landing craft, and also take fighters and helicopters. So you can send everything in one go, and you shop and you give a range of capabilities to your allies, and you look really, really beneficial and useful turning up. Good example of a country which is currently pushing that route is Australia. They have two LHDs. And the Canberra class are really useful strategic assets for their allies. They have a lot of needs, but they have a small population. Again, this is going to be more part of video two. So there are reasons for them going for the LHD route rather than the carry route. Despite the fact they used to operate aircraft carriers. But that represents a useful asset to put in the plug into an alliance. And therefore, from the alliance's perspective, that means they become a worthwhile partner within our alliance, if especially they're willing to send those things. So it is a constant discussion of which size, what's my level of exposure, what's my level of support, what can I do? So what carrier fits me? Now... To be honest, some of that decision is going to be made by this, your air group size. What do you need to do? What do you need to do? Do you need to do cap? Okay, well that's going to be at least 18 aircraft if you want to do it properly. Do you want to be conducting anti-submarine warfare operations? That's going to be a dozen to 18 helicopters. Usually these days. Um, do you need to do airborne early warning? Well, that's going to be four to six aircraft, maybe three, if you're really doing it bare bones, but you're going to be looking at that. Do you want to have a strike package generation capability? All right, so you do. 
do you want to be able to do persistent operational support of forces ashore? Well, that then becomes a ratio kind of like a cap of 18. You want to generate that. You want to generate it more continuously. You're going to need 36 aircraft because you need to be generating those four uh, those four strike uh, strike loaded aircraft over the desired area of ground operations. Or are you looking instead of persistent support for ground forces? Are you looking at a strike capability, whereby you can launch strikes? Well, that's something which is interesting because theoretically you can use some of the cap aircraft to support that if they have the role. But that's going to affect your ability to run your cap. So can you do that in high threat scenarios? Probably not. Where you cannot strip the aircraft off your cap. Combat air patrol. Just in case I need to say that again. In that scenario. You could well be talking about 18 aircraft again. But you could go as low as 12. Because strike package is something you're going to generate. Bring back. And then rearm sort out and then decide where you're going to strike again. You're not going to be necessarily doing a constant stream strike effect. You're not necessarily going to do that. So you can go for less aircraft. So that is usually when you can have your variable number of aircraft. Your cap is not so variable as long as you're only maintaining one cap on station of roughly four aircraft airborne. They might be split up in pairs but that's sort of one cap. If However, you decide you want more, well, that's going to make things more complicated. Theoretically, theoretically, if you decide you want two caps airborne at any one time, my eight aircraft airborne at any one time, it's not a, it's not 36 aircraft you need. Theoretically, you can get by with 32 which is eight sets of four. But that's with interlo uh, interweaving the aircraft. So uh, some, uh, to an extent, you've got, let's say, Caps 1 and 2 airborne, Cap 1 is sent, Cap 3 is launched, Cap 4 is then brought up, and that sort of thing. You're interweaving between different squadrons for maintaining different cap stations, and sometimes you're combining aircraft from the squadrons. It's... Probably easier just to have 36 aircraft, but that then gives you the equivalent of 9 caps, uh, which you're rotating through to maintain the 2 in the air, which really does make it easy to do, and also makes it far easier for you to maintain aircraft maintenance. If you look at this hangar picture, you can see the level of maintenance going on, the fact that this is a hive activity. There's almost every single plane you can see in this hangar is having something done to it. That is the pressure operations. And the more airframes you have, the easier it is to generate those aircraft. Because if, let's say you have eight aircraft, so I have eight aircraft, and one of those is damaged, and one of those needs maintenance on its engine, I'm down to six. Not unusual. So I've lost 25% of my force. Trying to generate a four aircraft strike from this eight aircraft. Well, I have four still to go, but I only have two left if I suffer any more damages, and I'm fixing those other two. Hopefully I get them fixed, but I've got issues. As you go up the large numbers, let's say you've got 18 aircraft, and let's say this time five aircraft are having issues. Two are having engine replacements. Bad scheduling timing going on here. Two are damaged by various actions they receive from enemy AA fire. And one has had a slightly bad landing where, frankly, the, let's say, the tail hook ripped off it. It did stop, but the tail hook is damaged and the whole back section of it. Well, I've still got 13 aircraft to generate my strike from. Yes. I've lost more by proportion, I've lost nearly a third of my force rather than a quarter of my force, but I've got far more aircraft to work from. I realise there are salesmen out there talking to you, especially if you are considering getting an aircraft carrier, who are going to tell you various things about ships and aircraft. 
They're going to tell you that two ships can guarantee the availability of a capability. They're going to tell you their aircraft are amazing and no one's ever going to hurt them. Well, one, the two aircraft carriers guaranteeing a capability is in a perfect world scenario. A perfect world scenario. It doesn't exist. It's in a world where you can predict every single accident and it never takes place. When the only maintenance ever needed is scheduled maintenance. And when no one ever does anything annoying that you do not predict. When you choose when you will have to fight a war or have to deal with an incident and only then will it happen. It is a glorious, glorious world. But sadly, it's not a human one. It isn't. And as for the aircraft being perfect and nothing ever happening to them, well, as long as aircraft are principally flown by squidgy organic things called humans, who are valuable, despite some of the god complexes which pilots, some pilots do, do actually develop. Let's be honest, we've all met our share of fighter pilots, and some of them truly do have Egos which you probably could see next to a sun if you could actually see the ego. But leaving that to one side, they're glorious and they tend to earn their egos, but the trouble is, they're still human. So, the reality is, you are going to have aircraft which are going to have issues. They are going to... Sometimes those issues are going to be mechanical issues. Sometimes those issues are going to be... One of your maintainers leaves something by accident somewhere, and that's going to fod out the engine, and the aircraft's going to go into the sea on takeoff. Humanity happens. It's not ship happens, it's humanity happens. So as long as humans are involved, and until we can completely eliminate the squidgy organic bits, which is going to be a long way away to completely eliminate them from maintenance and operation and everything, thankfully, in many ways, for our, our, for our survival, because let's be honest, the moment we do eliminate the need of the squidgy organic bits, there's going to be not a lot left for us to do, other than hand over the card and the ability to switch on the lights, or switch off the lights to the AI overlords. Which will make life so boring. Honestly, it will do. Let's be honest, we need, we need challenges. But leaving that all to one side. You have to factor into your air group size, and therefore into your carrier size, because it's going to affect how big a hangar you need. And therefore how big a carrier you need. Something for dealing with life. You cannot design your ships around a perfect world. You have to have some spare, some slack in the system. I know there is an economic model in the world which is obsessed with just-in-time logistics and not having things wasting away in a warehouse. It's not the same when you're fighting a war or carrying out any form of military operations with a lot of very expensive equipment and very complicated equipment that needs a lot of maintenance and a lot of careful assessment before it can be used because it's being pushed to the bleeding edge of what we actually like to do as humans or actually able to do as humans. So, yeah. You need to think about that. You need to think about what you're going to generate. And let's say, let's work for our air group, therefore. Let's say we decide we want to have ASW capability, we want airborne warning, early warning capability, and we want that to be provided by helicopters. So we say we want six helicopters at least for that role. Our ASW helicopters will also do dual role as search and rescue helicopters, so we'll have 18 of those. Okay, so that's 24 helicopters. Park that. Okay, I want a cap. Okay, that's 18 fighters. And I want a strike capability. Now, do I want it to be persistent? Do I want it to be able to assist the cap, maybe, if I need to, if I go into a higher threat scenario and maybe uh, spare some aircraft for that? So, probably another 18 is probably going to do me. Okay, what's that? 60 aircraft. So, I've literally got strike. Cap, 
ASW, Airborne Early Warning, Search and Rescue. I've got 60 aircraft. Now, here's the thing. So if I need that for my carrier battle group, I couldn't farm some of those helicopters off to the escorts. I can do that. It's not necessarily a sensible idea because... I don't have the same central capabilities, and also what's even better is when my escorts are carrying those as are carrying helicopters as well as me carrying enough to do from my carrier, because then I definitely have enough helicopters, and that's going to be far more secure in going into sort of high threat environments. But if I want to save money, or if I am in a scenario where, frankly, there's a limit to what I can get out of the, uh, the government is prepared to pay. There's a limit to what they set on their security. Then that's an option. So I'm looking for 60-ish aircraft, realistically. Now, if I want to do multiple strikes, then I'll be going greater than that. If I want to have maybe electronic warfare capability, those will be more aircraft. Maybe that'll be another six to eight. Uh, there'll be another six to eight aircraft. Or might be a whole strike package in and of itself. Strike group of itself. Another 18 aircraft. It's going to depend on what level of capability you want. But it's very easy to see how the America got up to carry air groups of 96 aircraft. It's very easy to see that. Because it doesn't take you wanting to do more. Well, hang on, we need to have more of a persistent strike, a stri a strike support presence, or we want to be able to hit more targets simultaneously. So we need more strike aircraft, and we want to be able to support our cap. So we want to have slightly stronger cap than we do. So we might want to actually have 24 aircraft for that, rather than 18. So we we'll go two squadrons of 12, and you know that means we can surge extra cap aircraft when we want. We don't. We usually maintain four, but. With the extra eight aircraft, we uh, every, extra six aircraft, we can have a second four ready to surge, so we can rapidly grow it to eight when we need to up there. But we can keep in fours and uh, normally. Uh, uh, what kind of strike targets are we looking at? All these things can work through. Okay, there are options here, but ultimately, what decides what type of carry you want is. What interests are requiring you to procure a carrier? How you want to use that carrier power, i.e. and therefore what kind of air group size you want. And that's going to decide what size carrier you want. There is a reason the Queen Elizabeth class for the Royal Navy, and I know I'm using them as a good example, but they're middle point. They are a fleet carrier. So they're middle point in the spectrum. They are able to take... 60 plus aircraft, 65 plus aircraft in full surge capacity in wartime. They will normally operate somewhere in the region of 48 aircraft. Roughly 50-50 helicopters and F-35Bs. Their most of their surge capacity is going to be for F-35Bs to take them up to 36. If you go through the maths of what I've just worked through of you, you can work out exactly what the British government is thinking they are going to need and what kind of capacity they have built into those carriers. It's very easy to work out what the governments are thinking and are thinking about as a likely conflict scenario or a potential conflict scenario from how they build their carriers because they have to function those things in. Now, I will say there is another problem for air group size, though. Something I'll be getting back to a lot later is an aircraft carrier will see multiple generations of aircraft throughout its life. It might start off with aircraft which are propeller powered and then move on to jet powered. Those aircraft and airframes might well grow in size, which is going to reduce the amount of capacity you have in your carrier. So one of the things you have to think about when you're designing your carrier is a level of future proofing. Are you including space? To still reach that minimum number of aircraft a generation or so away. Working out what the likely size or potential size of that aircraft is going to be. Because that's an important measure for you to think about. And it becomes even more important the smaller the carrier you have. 
The nation which is least worried about the future size of aircraft is the US, the US, because they have supercarriers. And so their air group is unlikely to find itself so large that they slip down below 72 aircraft in capacity size. It's unlikely for that to happen. Because they have a capacity which is far greater to operate in terms of surge capability. So, this is a factor in thinking. This is why you have the bigger aircraft carrier. It's why you might well get a bigger aircraft than perhaps you actually need. Because having that capability means that you have the future proof of dealing with the larger aircraft which will come next. So there is a reason behind that. So, next you have what kind of deck configuration will your carrier need to be. And that, again, is going to reflect you as a nation and how you see your carrier operating. We have three here. They are all fleet carrier sized. We have the Kuznetsov, which is Stobar. Short takeoff, barrier assisted recovery. It's got the speed of short takeoff. But it's able to recover aircraft, heavier aircraft, because of its barrier-assisted recovery. That can help, because if you can land aircraft at a heavier weight, they can take off heavier. But also, they are more likely to return with a full ordnance load if they haven't managed to take it. Or they haven't managed to take it to the target or haven't used it. So you've, you're not running a risk of reaching ordnance overload. And therefore needing to eject stuff before you can land back on your carrier. That did used to be a problem at certain points in history. Uh, certain points in history, aircraft were literally dropping their weapons before they came back to a carrier. Because they couldn't land with those weapons on because they'd be too heavy for facilities. Then we have Catabar. Catapult assisted takeoff, barrier assisted recovery. It can launch and recover the heaviest aircraft. It can. It's useful. However, this does put incredible strains on aircraft. The barrier-assisted recovery is the equivalent of an accident. And the strains of a catapult-assisted takeoff can dramatically shorten an aircraft's life. And please note, before anyone picks me up on the aircrafts there, it's aircraft apostrophe S. I was using that as. As we all know, it doesn't matter if it's one aircraft or five aircraft. It doesn't have an S on the end for, multiple, uh, for multiples. So... Finally, at the top, we have Queen Elizabeth class. It's Charles de Gaulle, just in case I didn't say that. I think I did, but just in case. Now, she is a shovel carrier. Short takeoff, vertical landing. Technically, actually, with the F-35Bs, they are a shovel carrier because they're short takeoff, rolling landing, because the F-35Bs are doing a rolling landing. Which is actually straight out of how aircraft used to land on carriers when they were the first generation. And they didn't have any ba any sort of uh, barrier-assisted recoveries. They didn't have any arrestor cable stretched across them. Although, to be fair, the first arrestor cable stretched across a carrier were um, longitudinal, not latitudinal. And the reason they were there was to stop the aircraft tipping over the side rather than to stop the aircraft by slowing it down. It's fun how things have evolved. It's like catapults used to be known as accelerators because catapults were used on sh on regular ships to launch aircraft and accelerators were used on aircraft to uh, carriers to launch aircraft because they were slightly different systems and they were set up different ways. So to, in order to make sure they were differentially understood, they were called different things. And technically, if therefore that had accelerator had been used rather than catapult, it would have been... Atobar rather than Catobar. 
And really, does Atobar sound the same as Catabar? I think Catabar does sound cooler. I can understand why they went with the catapult assisted rather than accelerator assisted takeoff. But what kind do you, do you want? Now, usually, this methodology, Catabar gets held up as the pinnacle of aircraft carrier tech. It is if that's what you want it for. Remember, go back to the beginning. What are your maritime interests? What do you need your carrier for? And there are advantages to each of these forms. There are. If you're going for a Stovel version, and if you are going with that, then you have the ability to land multiple aircraft pretty much simultaneously, because they can do multiple vertical, vertical descents into spots, like you have helicopters landing and taking off from vert multiple spots some, pretty much simultaneously. You can do it with aircraft and bring them all down very safely. You're putting also less strain in a way on the actual aircraft doing that, but you are putting more strain on your deck in some ways. That's something you have to watch because of the heat blooming and effect of the heat of the aircraft landing. You're also able to launch very quickly without any cycle time. You don't have to cycle the catapults to launch the aircraft. Literally, you can just tell the aircraft, go, 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 and stack them up and launch them. So it's very attractive from that perspective. It also puts less requirements on the carrier systems because catapults either require steam, if they're the traditional systems, prior to that they were hydraulic, but today also there are emails, electromagnetic catapults assisted launches, or electromagnetic systems, which, inc which require either some sort of capacitator technology or a very, very powerful engine or rather nuclear reactor to provide you enough power to be able to operate them consistently. Gas turbines can do it as well if they're, you know, depending on how they're hooked up to the system and how you've got it arranged. But the thing is, that is buying into Catabar. And for both Stovall and Catabar, there are a limited number of airframes available. But, saying that, they are different methodologies of operation. And they can reflect a different focus and mindset. Because, let's say you are a medium power, a smaller nation, i.e. Britain in this case, you can, oh, France of course is another medium power, so I can talk through the cases of both, and I'm going to. Medium power, they've gone, well, we've got, we're going to get two of these carriers, we're going to have them stovel. That is, in a way, a continuation of what the British already had with the F-35B. Um, because they, you know, already had the Harrier, so they're basically continuing on from that. And you can say it's to extent inertia. But also there's the reality that for Britain, that represents a level of strategic independence on their ships. Let me explain. Continuation down the road, Britain might get an LHD, a couple of LHDs or something like that to replace Albion and Bulwark. They may not, but let the most recent design iterations before we dropped out of the Anglo-Dutch project to replace the uh, Albion, Bulwark and the LSLs, etc. looked increasingly like an LHD. And it does seem to be moving in a direction. We'd probably be talking about maybe it having its own ski jump. So like the Japanese. In which case we could operate our F-35Bs from them. And that would mean if something happened to the carrier, they could still land on those and we would be independently organic. Also, it means that Britain can develop and maintain its skills itself. Because it has these two carriers, because the way of the F-35Bs, the way of Vistal Takeoff means you can maintain the skills far more organically yourself. It's not a specialized landing skill set as necessarily using catapult assisted and takeoff and barrier assisted recovery. Now, the French, who are well known for pursuing a very independent track in the world, have gone with Catabar. It does give them a carrier which has the Raphael M, so they haven't gone the American route in terms of they're not required to buy the Super Hornet or the F-35C. They have got their own aircraft, which they're developing. They have got the E-2C Hawkeye. So they are linked in terms of the airborne early warning aircraft. But 
what they have also had to do is do a lot of joint training with the Americans. It's rather an interesting scenario because with their sole carrier being Katabar configuration, they do a lot of integration into the wider American carrier force in order to sustain their capabilities and sustain the very, very specialist skills you need to not just operate aircraft in terms of the pilots from a, cat uh, from a catabar carrier, but also the technicians, maintainers, engineers, officers, and all the other skilled personnel you need on a ship to maintain that capabilities. The French, and it's not to say the French do not have an independent capability, they do. It is just in order to maintain that independent capability, they plug themselves heavily into the American program because it allows them a larger pool of experience to draw from than their one carrier would. They used to have two carriers, the Fock and the Clemenceau, and at one point, uh, with Aramash, uh, were operating three carriers simultaneously. So they have got a rich carrier heritage. And then we come to the Kuznetsov. Now, I always feel bad about this ship, because whenever I start talking about it, it can sound like I'm picking on it. But I'm not picking on it because of it. It is a very interesting ship. It's just not always been well maintained and well looked after. Witness scenes of huge black smoke coming from it when it's wandering around the world. And that's mainly because it is the only Russian carrier, so it gets pushed out a lot and pushed into various climates which are not good for operating a carrier with that level of complicated uh, of complicated and sensitive machinery in for long periods of time. You do it when you have to, not out of choice, though. Now, the problem with being Stobar is pretty much you are a single source occupier of that. So... Pretty much, you are the only one who is operating that aircraft of that scenario. For France, they have they can go and pl they can go and work with the Americans and interoperate with them. For Britain, they can operate interoperate with the Americans because the Americans operate Stovall carriers as well. They're they're LHDs, the America class and the Wasp class. They can also go and operate with the Italians, who also operate a Stovall carrier, and the Japanese and a few other powers as well who have Stovall ships. Australia's Canberra's technically not supposed to support F-35Bs and technically had that bit removed, but do still have ski ramps because they are based on a Spanish design, which has the ski ramps. So F-35Bs Vistal approach does, because of the number of smaller carriers especially, which have gone with that approach, does allow you to integrate them into their alliances and them into your alliances a lot easier if you have that sort of system. So, in a way, you could argue that France has plugged itself into the American capability of the larger fleet carriers, and Britain has plugged itself into the alliance structure by going, we're going to be the leader of the smaller carriers, and we're going to have the largest, the fleet carrier, that, ser that services the aircraft which go on the smaller carriers, and that's how we're going to maintain a leadership role, because we can sustain and help support all of our smaller allies in fights. It's methodologies. You can see it working through, and you can see it being discussed around the edges. Very few people, they won't usually come out and say these sort of things. With the Russians pursuing an independent capability, there's a reason they went for Stobar. They were going for something which gave them the quickest launch viability because of the realities of their likely combat scenarios when they're working through, but which also allowed them to recover aircraft which were still heavy. So they could launch very solid aircraft with heavy weapons loads for air defense, and they could recover them. They needed to modify their engines and play around with them to make sure they could launch them, but they were happy to do that because it got them the capability they needed. These are your, pretty much your free options for aircraft uh, from a carrier. It doesn't matter whether they are crewed, uncrewed, optionally crewed. These are your methods of launching, pretty much. Everything's a variation of them. And recently, of course, yes, you will probably have seen discussions with the Queen Elizabeth class of maybe adding catapults or systems on them to assist with the launching of certain drone types and whether they can be inserted. Now, 
I have to say I'm not surprised there are various projects considering this because these ships will carry multiple generations of aircraft. We don't really want to get into how many generations the Paul Kuznetsov has been through. The, uh, the Queen Elizabeth class are on their first generation. And Charles de Gaulle, she's interesting. Now, technically, she's had Raphael M's from the beginning, and they have considered other aircraft, but they haven't gone to them. But those Raphael M's have evolved. They are not the same Raphael aircraft which came into service in 1986. Uh, they are certainly not the aircraft which first got a border in 2001. The Raphael is one of those interesting programs where they might have the same name, but the aircraft keep evolving and they keep being upgraded. The French are constantly investing in them. Now, what I will say is I'm not sure how much longer that will necessarily hold for, because she was in commission first in 2000, she is probably going to serve till about 2040, maybe a bit longer, and the French are talking about getting another aircraft carrier into service. Should they do that, should they go through that approach, I would not be surprised if they go for a new aircraft as well, a new strike aircraft. I'd be interested to see what they select. Uh, it will be domestic French produced aircraft. Um, that's been the, the whole whole subject of French naval aviation pretty much since the 1950s has been a francophonication of it. They want to make it as French orientated as possible. And they're shameless about this, and I completely support it. It's, it's something I completely understand. If they've decided that's going to be a key part of their organic capability, that they produce all their capability, they produce their aircraft, they produce those facilities, then that's fine. It'll be interesting to see what comes next, because in my experience, the French do one of two things. They either produce an incredibly conservative design, which is barely a reskinning of the previous version of the aircraft in the history. Or they go for something completely out the box, which is completely off the, uh, the ballywack of everyone else's thinking, and produce something which is really interesting and tends to set the world alight a bit, because it'll have ideas and capabilities thrown into it, which everyone will go, we haven't thought about that. So it'll be really interesting to see what does come next with the French. Engine selection. Well, again, I have the same three beauties. Because, do you want gas turbines? Do you want nuclear power? Do you want steam plant? Now, if you want steam catapults, you're going to need pretty much one of these two. Honestly, that's it. Uh, if you want to have emails, you're probably going to need one of these two. Mon steam plants are very, very good. But the thing is, gas turbines can boost up far more quickly for the cycle of electromagnetic of generating the electricity needed for an email. So, probably gas is going to come in. Are you looking for a global capability? In which case, nuclear power is a really useful tool to go. It means that the ship, can, the carrier can act as both air, carry more fuel for its aircraft and can act as a tanker for other ships in its task group because it has enough. It doesn't need to carry fuel for itself. Are you, how do I put this politely, less keen on spending money on nuclear-powered surface ships, or do you worry about the domestic implications of parking a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier in a major center of urban population? In which case, gas turbines might be for you. Not because of the reality of the for nuclear, uh, nuclear reactors, unless they are attacked while in harbor, uh, they they should be fine. Touch wood, he says. Um, because of the public perception and the likely political fallout. And if you're really going for steam-powered ships, welcome to the 1940s. It's great to have you here. As a historian, I always love anyone else who jumps back here, but why?! In the modern world, would you go, be going for an oil-fired steam boiler approach? Okay, yes, it will give you the necessary power and speed, but there are so many easier ways of doing this. 
So, you have options. This is going to be another big impact because this is going to be something which sets the pace of your task group. It sets the pace of your aircraft operations. It's going to affect your deck selection. Once you decided you're going gas, well, then you have to decide whether emails are going to work. When the Queen Elizabeth class were first being put into service and first being built, there was considered enough risk in their design that the emails ended up being factored out. And when later on in the design, oh, in the construction program, when a government, change of government came in and went, oh, shall we put them in? Well, all they succeeded in doing was running up the bill. And this is the first uh, biggest lesson from this video for you if you are choosing a carrier. For goodness sake, make your decisions about the designs now. Once you've decided design, stick with it. Don't modify it while it's being built. It's just going to cause you horrendous bills. When you sign a contract with a defense con uh, contractor or a shipyard and they're building something, part of their entire uh, profit margin is predicated on the idea of you changing your mind because every government does and that's the point at which you crack open the contract renegotiate and they have you over a barrel and they will use that they are publicly listed companies their job is to get a profit to reward their shareholders that is literally their legal obligation You've written the laws so. Do not be surprised, therefore, when they do it. <sighs> Command facilities. So, what is your carrier's job going to be? It's probably going to be a task group commander, so it's going to need some kind of command facilities. As well as air group coordination, it's going to need to be able to control and coordinate in with its task group, the ships around it. But is it going to be a task force command ship? Is it going to need the ability to interface with multiple other task groups? Is it perhaps going to be a fleet flagship? Is it going to be having to coordinate operations maybe over a whole region or wider than just a task force of responsibilities? What kind of command stuff do you need to include? That's both personnel... Facilities for those personnel, but also these data screens, computer terminals, space for people to look at those computers. That's all got to be built in. That's all got to be factored into your decision making. How are you going to do this? What are you going to do? How much space are you prepared to allocate to it? And again, this affects the size of your carrier because, again, these three carriers show different approaches to it. The French have added in basically an extra deck on the island structure. The Soviets, as they were then, Russians now, well, they've tried to factor it in and move it all over the place. It's kind of broken up. Instead of it being a section, it's broken up all over the place inside the hull. It's a bit fun. The British have a command centre facility, but also they have a twin island structure. This is another factor of the gas propulsion. They needed the extra stack, i.e. the extra funnel space, for getting rid of the exhaust gases. So, okay... There's also the fact that the British traditionally do have the island structure further forward because it's better for conning, but some prefer the island structure further aft because that's better for coordination of aircraft. Well, the British turned this into a virtue, have gone for Twin Towers approach, and honestly claimed that Lord of the Rings was in no way at all an inspiration for its design. It's actually becoming more common, if you look up the Trieste class LHD that the Italian Navy has just, into, uh, just brought into service, they've also gone with a twin uh, island approach. And that's because it does offer, offer potentially the best of both worlds if you design it properly. It's something you have to be very careful about the design of, and there are going to be factors which mitigate against it, but it can be advantageous if done properly and if it fits with your needs. Again, I cannot emphasize this more. In no scenario is it a one-size-fits-all solution. You can adapt a one-size-fits-all solution to your needs 
for the emergencies of a war. So you can get, especially the larger a carrier is, the easier it is to adapt to anyone's needs for the, uh, for the, uh, for the course of war. But it's not what you build to fit your needs, because it doesn't fit your needs in peacetime. And remember, these warships have to do a lot of conflict management, conflict deterrence, training, exercises, and operations in peacetime. They're going to spend a lot more time in peace than they are in war. So a big factor, hopefully, if they do their jobs right and you and the government does their job uh, does its job right as well, they're going to spend more time in peace than they are in war. So hopefully, you have to think about that as a factor when you're designing the ship. You have to design it as much for peace as it for war. And for example, the British with the Queen Elizabeth class, you could argue, if we go back to an earlier picture, they do kind of stick out with the Twin Islands. Kind of raises their profile a bit, which is useful for a smaller nation which wants to maximise its image and presence on the global, on the global, uh, you know, stage. They've got a very distinctive shape and outline. It's good for presence missions. Complicated for other things, but it works. Then we've got its own defences. Now, here there are three carriers. There is the Italian Conte de Cavour. There is the Charles de Gaulle at the back. And there is an American carrier in the middle. Sorry, misspoke. She's the Cavour. She's not the Conte de Cavour. That was the battleship. One has to remember. And the the American carriers that are Harry S. Truman. Now, which of these ships is the most heavily armed? If you remove their air group from them, from each of these ships, which of these ships is the most heavily armed? That's a factor. It can be a factor for whatever reason, but you have to think about it. Which is the most heavily armed of them? And... Honestly, the answer is the Cavour. She has um, four eight-cell installations of uh, A43 silver launchers carrying Asta-15 surface-to-air missiles. So that's 32 Asta-15 uh, Asta missiles. Two Otto Malera 76 mm guns. Three 25-80 guns. And... Um, some also uh, some various decoy launching systems. You can argue she is definitely the most heavily armed for her side uh, for in this picture, and that's a choice. Some nations will literally go with just phalanx or C ram, C whiz, close in weapon systems. Why? Because to them. The carrier's defences are about immediate, a last-ditch defence of itself, and providing the aircraft to be the outer defence of a carrier battle, of a battle group, of a task force. That's what the cap's for. And then the other ships within the task group are about providing those extra layers of defence. However, if you are the Italians here, they've gone, well, we've got a smaller navy. We don't know how thick that outer layer of defence is going to be, and those layers are going, those layers of cap are going to be, and let's be honest, we don't carry a lot of aircraft. We really don't. The hang capacity is roughly 10 F-35Bs. So maybe we want to have a slightly thicker layers of defense for the actual carrier itself to maximize its capability. And again, that's perfectly understandable. But that's a trade-off you have to think through. And you can stand there and go, well, this aircraft carrier seems to me to be woefully underarmed. Well, the point is, it's not supposed to be in a scenario... If it's in a scenario where the close-in weapon systems are actually working, then a lot has gone wrong. Or rather, the enemy has managed to get through a lot of layers. Now, you hope that never happens... But is it better be prepared for them to get through those layers and have they not happen? Or to count on not getting through those layers and not be prepared if they do? It's a question because it costs money. And also, it 
makes things difficult in some regards. If you have missiles, you have to position themselves, the, those missile launchers specifically, so that they do not interrupt the flow of aircraft operations. And they hopefully do not leave FOD, or fragments or debris, on the deck, which can be sucked up into the engines and can break your own aircraft. So that's the trouble with missile systems. With guns, well, you don't have to feed them with ammunition. You have to position them. You have to deal with their weight and their supply and their maintenance. And those things are all going to require crew and logistics and training and cost. So all of that becomes a factor that you have to think through, you have to deal with and have to make a decision about and it's up to you. When you are building your carrier, you want to build a carrier, you have to decide what is the level of risk you are prepared to accept. And one of the advantages of this, when governments are deciding this, is of course, as a rule, the people who are making decisions and the end and final call on these things are not betting their own lives. Now, there are going to be a lot of admirals, a lot of senior officers, senior engineers who are involved, who do have that level of skin in the game, who might well find themselves on the aircraft carrier in a conflict. They are often the ones, for example, there was a senior admiral in the designing of the Royal Navy's Invincible class carriers. When presented a design which showed them completely unarmed, with no weapons other than 20mm cannon, said he would refuse to serve on board that ship because it had no chance of surviving combat. That was one of the reasons why they ended up getting the sea dart system. And other systems fitted. But that is a judgment call to be made at the time. And the politicians could have quite happily gone also, we will accept your, your resignation then and find someone who won't object to it. You hope that would be a very tough task, but sadly it's not always the case. And the politicians can honestly believe, everyone can believe the idea that the world is, it's a low risk threat of actual conflict. They have to be visibly prepared for conflict because of their interest, because of the needs to have an aircraft carrier, but the actual likelihood of combat, a conflict is low. In that scenario, we're kind of talking like the British and the Americans in the 1920s and 30s. When the British and America both maintained war plans for fighting each other because, by treaty and by reality, they were the two largest powers in the world. For the 1920s and 30s, they, they had the two largest navies. They were spread around the world. So, you know, they had to because if the worst case happened, they could end up at war against each other. They have to maintain a plan for a, a plan for it. But the realistic chance of a war between Britain and America in that period is incredibly low. I know there are all sorts of discussions based around the naval race, etc. going on, but it was a qualitative, not a quantitative race. The Americans were building a load of 16-inch gunships. The British had a load of 15-inch gunships. The British were going to respond with an 18-inch ship. It was... Instead of the quantitative race, which had gone on between Britain and Germany as part of the Anglo-German naval race, where the Germans were specifically building a certain number to challenge the British, or the risk fleet theory, which the British did know about, the Americans were building it for their own security, very, uh, very, uh, very clear about putting it out, and they had legitimate reason for it. They have the Atlantic and the Pacific. They have two huge oceans to have a fleet in. They have risks on either side to manage. They have the their various doctrines they have to do with their worldwide operations. There's both legitimate reasons and the fact that their ships were the other side of the Atlantic. Or even better, the other side of America from Britain. That was a very different scenario than Germany. And to be fair... A qualitative race actually takes the heat out of tensions in a way a quantitative race puts the heat in. Because a quantitative heat race is all about the numbers, so it's always a constant going, how many building, how many building, 
how many are they building? How many are we building? That sort of thing. Whereas if you think about it, a qualitative race is kind of like, look at the, you know, you have several sales managers in a company, and one year one turns up with, I don't know, a brand new Audi sports car. Next year, their main rival turns up with an Aston Martin. The year after that, the Audi guy has swapped up to a, La a Lamborghini. The year after that, the Aston Martin guy is now driving a Ferrari. That sort of scenario. So it's, it's unlikely to cause any violence because both are just more interested in one-ing up the other and they're always thinking, well, next year I'll come back with something even bigger. I can beat that. It, it's, it's not a threat scenario. It's a competition scenario. But the trouble is, if you are thinking in the model of one, it makes you very, very badly placed for the model of the other. And for the British, coming out of World War One, coming out of the scenario of World War One, and some of the American observers coming out of it, it was hard to see the British transition from where they'd been in a qualitative race with Japan, Italy, Austria occasionally, and America. Germany really hadn't been part of the qualitative race, uh, whilst also being in a quantitative race with Germany, to just being in that qualitative race. While there was a sort of quantitative race going on between Japan and America. It's a fun time. It really is a fun time to study. But why does that all factor in back into an aircraft carrier's own defences? Because you have to take an accurate reading of your security surroundings and make your estimate when you're choosing how you're going to defend your aircraft carrier, when you're choosing what you're going to do about its defences. And then we've got its hotel facilities. Because here is the other reality. Are the crew going to be pootling around the local area not far from your home? In which case, how much recreational facilities do you need to include? How much space do you need for them to relax, for them to exercise in the gym, for medical facilities? What kind of scenarios do you need to actually implement for them? If they're only going to be out at sea for a week at a time, and they're mostly going to be coming back to home, you can think about those things in terms of minimal. But if you are planning on doing months to years long as a deployment, you are planning on being able to operate a long way away from home, perhaps not going into port for weeks, if not months at a time. Well, you'd better have some facilities to make them not go mad. It's, it's just the basic requirements. You know, you're going to want to have some gym facilities, you're going to need to have medical facilities because people are going to get things. People are going to drink iron brew and need to see a dentist. They are going to drink too much coffee and get all sorts of stomach issues. They are going to damage themselves working on a plane or doing something in the engine room and they're going to need those medical facilities. There's going to be some sort of fire on board usually because you've got a lot of complicated systems and you've got kitchens it's, that are cooking a lot of meals every single day. So, yeah... The longer you're talking about operating your carrier for, the further away you're planning on talk operating your carrier away for, the more you've got to think about hotel facilities. And that's also to do with electrical generation and all the other things on the ship. What kind of facilities do you need to support the operations? What kind of plumbing are you going to need? Again, how long are you operating for? Guess what? That's going to have an impact on the number of loos and showers you need. Because you more and more have to factor in what happens if showers get damaged? What happens if showers stop working and need maintenance? Do I want everyone to be out of a shower or do I want the shower facilities to be mildly inconvenienced but not much of a problem? Again, it comes back to the same issues as air group numbers and aircraft numbers. You can get by with X number of showers. Do you want to only fit X number of showers, or do you want to fit Y number of showers? 
or maybe go even more and have Z number of showers. And the same will lose. And then, of course, that also factors in of, are you planning on having events aboard ship? Are you planning on having diplomatic dinners? Are you planning on having functions? Are you planning on using the ships for outreach? In which case, you'd better have areas you can secure off, so that you can keep those lovely guests away from things they don't want to see, you don't want them to see. You also need extra facilities because you don't want those people running around your ship in random places with the cover of, we're hunting to lose. You don't. Or the heads. And no matter what you call them on the ship. You do not want a Helen Mirren style scenario from um, Red. The movie Red a few years ago where the you know just coming down ever going I'm sure the loser down here no the loser clearly signposts up there if you're heading here you're going to get dealt with probably if it's Helen Mirren coming towards you the real Helen Mirren you don't need to reach immediately for the lethal force but if it's a Helen Mirren Helen Mirren style character from that movie go straight to lethal force and pull up the body armor. So, these are all things you have to think about. And gunnery ranges and facilities aboard for training marines. If you've got search and rescue, you might have mar you might have troops as well who are supposed to do uh, search and rescue for scenarios where people go down behind enemy lines. Because again, those pesky aircraft and those pesky or squishy organic bits can get into trouble. And you have to go and collect them. Because otherwise it looks bad. And also because that person is a significant investment of money and time in training. And frankly, they are more difficult to replace than the, than the aircraft sometimes. And then we have the task group. These are four different task groups. One is a fairly recent one involving a British aircraft carrier. One is a fairly recent one involving an American aircraft carrier. The two at the top. Those are that. One is a cold, height of Cold War period involving an American ca aircraft carrier with its full task group around it. Every single piece of firepower it can get. Multiple layers. Probably one of the most fundamental forces ever put to sea. And then we have an Indian carrier battle group based around two carriers, but with the available escorts they have as well. You have different calculations. I remember a few years ago, there was a whole discussion over fleet numbers for Britain, and this, I'm going to bring this up because it's a good one to illustrate discussions. We were originally looking at ordering 12 Type 45. The order went down to 9. Eventually, on requirements of being able to start the carriers and then the Type 26 program more quickly, we took six. Now, the choice was made that area air defense destroyers weren't really that needed at that time. And instead of maybe procuring some and putting them in ornery rather than commissioning them, i.e. holding the naval equipment reserve, and then using the vessels which were in ordinary as the ones you sent, you basically decommissioning ships to maintenance, uh, to, res uh, to ordinary status, to go through refits and being able to keep the group at six available, even when uh, even when ships are in major refits so any minor refits, you know, drop your numbers uh, for anything they went with six because they were looking at what time the world of the early 2000s, and they thought, it's peaceful. There is nothing going on in the world that's going to require an area air defense destroyer. Everything is going to be counterinsurgency and worlds of choice from now on. And so, we can go with six. That's what I did. The, the actual description goes, in 2000 they were planning 12. By 2004, when the building started in roughly 2003, they dropped down to 8. And by a couple of years later, it was down to 6. That's what happened. Everyone was sure there was going to be peace. Everyone 
who was in power believed that the world didn't need these capabilities. They, these were going to be capabilities you had because they were a component of a task group whenever you put a task group together. They weren't really necessary. You only need enough so you could tick the box of saying you had them for a carrier battle group. You didn't actually have to necessarily go, well, do we have enough to sustain them if we take losses, etc. like that, because you're not going to lose things. And that's the ultimate problem when you get into carriers and force designs, is that you have to think beyond your current generation. You're designing a carrier, which a ship which is going to service maybe one, two, three generations of aircraft and ships. You're going to be building components around it for a long time. They will outlast their escorts. They will outlast their escorts in service. They will outlast generations of escorts. And that is scary for a lot of people to think about when they're designing these ships, when they're thinking about their capabilities, when they're thinking about the realities of their needs. Because... What are we going to be dealing with? What is the world going to be like? Humans tend to want to believe the world is going to get more peaceful because that is a hope. That is a dream. That is why Star Trek was built on the idea of peaceful future of a world where things were solved by discussions where humanity had moved beyond its divisions to spread out and unify with other species in the stars and go into space. It's a wonderful dream by Gene Roddenberry. It's a wonderful dream. But Gene had another dream. He had another world he talked about, the world of Andromeda. And if you've ever seen that series, humanity is riven. And I often say, we hope for Star Trek we have to prepare for Andromeda. When I'm talking to crowds who are very into their sci-fi, that's what I say. You can hope for Star Trek, you hope for that world, you have to prepare for Andromeda. But the reality of a lot of procurement over recent years is when we're talking about our aircraft carriers, when we're procuring for our aircraft carriers, or you're procuring ships, is they've been procured so you can tick the box because you've looked at your strategic interests. You've looked at these realities we discussed at the beginning, right back here, and gone, we have to have an aircraft carrier or we aren't, we aren't servicing our security needs. We aren't servicing, we are going to look bad. And the whole way through, what has happened is the boxes have been ticked. So yes, we've got that capability, we've got that capability. Without anyone asking, have we got enough of that capability for our interests? And what is the reality of our security situation? Not what we want our security situation to be, but what is the reality of it? Now, this video has probably been slightly British-centric, and I will hold my hand up to it, but that's because I'm most familiar with the process from the British perspective, because that is what I've grown up with. That's what my father was involved with as a naval architect, working alongside what the academics I've worked with over years have been interfacing with, what I myself have interfaced with at various points. So I can speak to that best as an example, because I know those examples. And even then, I know I haven't given the full context and nuance for all the discussions around all the points in this video, but if you would ex uh, would mind excusing that, it's 90, it's 90 minutes long, probably at least already, and we haven't got to the end yet, uh, to go into all the details and all the nuance of the procedures more than I have done now, which I feel has helped provide the narrative through the various points, we'd be talking 
a video which was about three to four days long. I'm not sure if my computer could process and edit that. I'm not sure if I could even upload that that long a video to YouTube. I think that might break their server system. And I doubt anyone would watch it the whole way through. No, people might claim they did, but honestly, they never they would never reach the end. So, yeah. It's future-proofing. It's thinking about your carrier is going to be servicing a lot more than just the ships you're talking about, the aircraft you're talking about, the events you're thinking of. And that's true for a lot of warships and a lot of major defense investments. Especially today when we're talking programs which run over decades. Recently it was announced that the Queen Elizabeth class are going to be in service till at least 2069. Because the government announced their out of service date will be 2069, and if we know one thing is true about any British ship's out of service date, they almost always, in fact, if we consider the legacy of the Type 23s and Type 42s and Hermes, yeah, pretty much every ship that served the Royal Navy in the last 60 years, they have always blown through they're out of service date and carried on serving. So when you are looking at the Queen Elizabeth class, this year I am 37. I will not be surprised. I will definitely not be surprised. If when I am in my late 80s, the Queen of Class are still in service with the United Kingdom. And if YouTube is still going and I'm still making videos, I promise to do a duet with this video and go, I was right! Just for the clout and the likes. So, I always finish my videos with a question. And it's simple, really. I want you to run your country. Whichever it is, through those lists. So now I know if you're British and watching this video, you're going to go, Well, you know, you've already run us through that strategic list. But think about it. Go through it. Because going through that strategic uh, discussion, and I will flick to it, so you can see it clearly, going through and asking those questions and then look at the actual fit of what Britain has done and ask yourself whether it has fitted. Now, I would argue that Stovall can work for Britain. As said, it does put it at the head, in a way, of the minor carrier operating powers, the smaller carrier operating powers. And it would also work with an LHD buy, which would make sense for Britain as a global power, but a medium, a medium global power, i.e. a power which has global projection capabilities and requires global projection, projection capabilities, but doesn't have the budget for the large separate fleets that America has. If you had a set of three LHDs, well... Uh, if push comes to shove, they can operate limited strike and airborne uh, uh, strike air defense capabilities from one of them. It gives you five flight decks, that usually gives you at least two available. It gives you three docks, which usually gives you at least one available. It's ability to project capabilities around the world. But, these are the questions you have to ask. Do you need an out-of-area expeditionary capability? Are you a fundamentally maritime economy? Which depends upon freedom of movement through critical choke points. Do you have a dependence upon maritime energy imports? Do you have vibrant, a vibrant global culture, social and political connections, which could evolve into military commitments? Do you have a large maritime border wherein the sea provides your conflict security for its strategic depth? Do you have a large exclusive economic zone which will require appropriate level of security? And finally, are you in an security environment whereby the strategic mobility of an aircraft carrier is desirable? Now, 
Are, is this an exhaustive list of all the questions you can ask to work this one out? No. He, for the first one, I included all the sub, uh, I included the three main sub questions, but believe it or not, there are sub questions below those sub questions, and I didn't bother for the next three to include the sub questions on them because at a certain point, when I work through the full list, it has 120 questions, and I also thought if I ask anyone to do that at the end, because I was looking at this as an idea for this question at the end of this video, I would be being evil. So I have simplified it down to what I consider are the core seven questions that can guide everything else. Everything else is a sub-question or a sub-sub-question of those. So, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And If you like the channel, please like the channel. Please maybe consider sharing. It's, all the support is gratefully received. And thank you. Thank you for making this possible. Thank you for supporting patrons. Thank you for supporting all those other things I do. And what do we have coming up? Well, this week we had French Naval Aircraft Squadron System. Next Wednesday, I'm not sure if there will be a video. There might be a video. This Wednesdays are, if I feel like doing an extra video, an extra video gets added in. If I don't, it doesn't. It's the, it's the bonus day of the week. And next Tuesday will be conception, operation, and conclusion of HMS Hermes, Hosho, and Langley. The original aircraft carriers. Or rather, the original built from scratch or first conversion post-World War I of the U.S. Navy for Langley. Because the U.S. Navy decided they were going to buck the trend. They weren't going to build a brand new carrier. They were going to convert a ship. Like other ships the British had converted. And then they converted Saratoga and Lexington. And then finally, finally, they got down to building an actual carrier. It took them time, but they got there. But we'll get to those. We will get to those. We've also got a video coming up at some point on Lexington class, which I'm looking forward to. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and take care.